is that we have the assurance of salvation. The assurance, the head knowledge, the heart knowledge that we have is salvation for eternity. And that is so important. This assurance. Assurance means that we know. He knows that he cannot destroy our salvation. By the time, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, Satan was realized that Jesus had won in his resurrection. But the goal of the devil is not to destroy the salvation of the Lord. The Lord, his works have already saved us. There's nothing that's added. We believe that God justifies us, that he has forgiven our sins on the cross from eternity to eternity of our salvation. The devil does not want us to rejoice in the Lord for our salvation and the blessings that God has provided because they are so abundant. Abundant. And Ephesians chapter 1, you know, we praise him for all of the gifts that he gives us through the blood of Jesus Christ, and it has covered all of our sins. So it is important. The, can the devil destroy our assurance of salvation, our joy of our So today, there are Christians who are depressed because they appear to have a misunderstanding about a couple of things. And there are four items. So misunderstandings about, number one, affliction and suffering. Why is it important that we talk about this? So suppose you ask somebody, you know, it seems like you've had a good life, your family, your job. Seems like there's been no family problems, no issues. And the husband's a Christian, and you ask, most likely their answer would be, well, you know, I, God's blessed me. Things have been going well in my life. Everything's been going fine, and I know I'm saved. Right? But some Christians who suffer wonder. It seems like they have such a good life. They're friends. Everything's going fine. They've not had any serious problems. You know, but I have problems after problems after problem. Am I not saved? No. It's true that God gives blessings. And God is the one who provides. But we cannot have an assurance of our salvation just based on God's providence. Meaning, God's blessings, givings, he is there with us regardless and our assurance of his salvation is based on his providence? No. It is not. Our assurance of salvation is established on the cross. If you look at the cross, that is God used it for our salvation. His blessings that come from there, the job that I have being perfect. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Still sinners. Remember, before we were saved, God had already sent Jesus to die on the cross. He came to save us. So it's the cross. That is the first place <coughs> in Hebrews. Have you forgotten the encouraging words that God spoke to you as his children? Have you forgotten? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And don't give up when he correct, corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his children. He doesn't punish you for your sins. The cross have already taken that. 
but he wants to teach us to go the right way and to avoid the wrong ways. And we can't interpret God's blessings as a sign of your salvation. You can't because we often don't know why God gives us blessings until later when God uses those blessings to help us help others to encourage us to stay consistent in the Lord. The Lord blesses us to prepare us maybe for our sufferings and then it helps us to remember how the Lord blesses us. So we can't interpret blessings as a sign of salvation. When you compare yourself to other people and their blessings, it means that they're saved and that you're not. No, you cannot depend. Secondly, our union with Christ, people misunderstand. When we receive salvation, we are in relationship with Christ. We are in Christ. His righteousness has been given to us. It clothes us. He gives us power and a life to glorify God. We share with Christ eternal life, peace, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the same things that Jesus has. We have union with Christ. So people misunderstand that and think that since I have relationship with Christ, union with Christ, that there's no more struggles, no more addictions, no more bad habits, that that's automatically over with. And some false teachers, like in the book of Colossians in the Old Testament, Jesus the disciples were confused and talking about in union with Christ you have no struggles with sin so you should be perfect and not fall into sin anymore no more bad habits and some say if you receive salvation and that you have union with Christ you should stop smoking right away people say i Stop smoking right after I received salvation. Well, thank God for that, but not everybody's the same. Everybody struggles. Some have a long struggle, and some may think that if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you should have no problems in your home or family life. There should be complete and total peace and joy, and that your life should be perfect and easy. And that's not true not what the false teachers tried to tell you that if you have a relationship with Christ everything is perfect from that point on there should be no more troubles no more habits no more sins that were perfect and that's not true that's very hypocritical it says but Paul said something different in Romans chapter 7 <coughs> I don't really understand myself for I want to do what is right but I don't do it Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is the sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful me. So Paul was struggling He said that the Christian life was going to be a struggle. If you all say that you feel that life's been going on okay and that you've not struggled with sin, maybe you don't have a true relationship with Christ. It could be a warning. When you happen to hear of people who seems to have been transformed, their lives have truly changed, and going forward, everything is perfect. That means they're saved, but I still struggle? Does that mean that I'm not saved? No, that's not true. That's the, the third one is the denial of Jesus. 
or Christ. Have you ever noticed in February somebody sent an email and it said, or on Facebook sent an email, it says, you know, Jesus' life, you know, about saying good things about Jesus and his life, but if you refuse to send it going forward, it means that you deny Christ. You know, you've seen those emails, and that causes us to feel guilty, and we feel like we have to send all these things. You know, I don't want to deny Christ, so I need to send it. And that's a silly, silly thought. Jesus said, if you deny me, I will deny you before my Father. Who is Jesus talking about? Those who were religious? And their heart had not a true understanding of the gospel. They denied Christ. But many Christians were guilty of denying Christ. Sometimes we're kind of scared to talk about Jesus. You know, hey, you believe in Jesus? You know, you feel bad. You know, I should have said yes. You know, I'm afraid to lose my friends. You know, that happened. What is the difference between Peter and and Judas. They did horribly against Jesus. Judas betrayed Jesus. He had told the religious Jewish leaders and led them to Jesus and he kissed Jesus and they arrested him. And Judas got 30 silver coins. You remember the story. Peter, what did he do wrong against Jesus? He denied Jesus three times. You remember? It was not like, you know, people, because I, he was angry. He, it wasn't just a gentle denial of Christ. He said, no, I am not a follower of Christ. You know? You no, know, I think I've seen you with Jesus. No, I am not. He became very angry. Yeah, I think I've seen you around him. And he cussed. And then by the time he heard the rooster crow, he remembered what Jesus had said. And he said, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. And true enough, that happened. And Peter felt horrible. Peter felt horrible for his sins against Jesus. Judas felt horrible about doing something wrong against Jesus? Both did. But Judas, he hung himself. He was great despair. Peter felt despair, but going forward, he was okay. What's the difference? First, told him that this is a secret and what you do and this and this planning against Jesus but the devil's goal was what to encourage Judas to become more depressed he became a little crazy very depressed and he hung himself now Peter he felt depressed he felt horrible yes but what was the difference? Peter looked at the cross and he knew the cross was his answer. He knew that he had sinned. Peter denied three times. Then later Jesus came to Peter and he says, do you love me? How many times did Peter ask? Yes, I love you. You love me? Yes, I love you. You love me? Yes, you know that I love you. It is to remind him of what he had done before, but regardless, he had been forgiven. It helps us to look back. Even though our sins are horrible, God has forgiven us, and we should feel relief. And there is a big difference between Peter, who looked to the cross. He was so different from Judas. So Jesus knew that Peter... It was a horrible sin of denial. But Jesus already knew way before. And he warned Peter 
the devil is going to get permission. He's going to bother you. <coughs> Simon, Simon, Satan has asked permission Shift. Shift means sift. Sift, I'm sorry. Wheat. Like you have the grain of the wheat and you're shift, sifting it. <laughs> you know, and then you get the flakes and stuff, the holes that the grain is not in that. The grain is there, but it's not in that. It's a test. The, you know that the grain is not in the hole. And this is a test. <coughs> so, like wheat. But next, what it said was, and Jesus said, But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So Jesus prayed that his faith would continue. So that when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. So Peter would come back and he would teach and encourage and give strength to those who were weak in their faith. Those who had done sin against the Lord. But Peter would strengthen them and encourage them because Peter went through the same thing. So if you notice, so when you come back, Jesus knew that Peter would come back. He didn't say if you came back. You know, just if you come back. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you'll continue into your sin and go into hell. No, he said when you come back. And Jesus knew Peter would come back and he would repent. Now four, which is the last, our conscience. Meaning, we know the difference between right and wrong. Even those that are not Christians have a conscience. You know, all of us have the law on our hearts. We should know the difference between right and wrong. Even those who are evil know that they should take care of children their children. They cherish their children. How do they know that? Because they have a conscience. Right? But understand that our conscience is not perfect. And a wooden chair, you know, it's built perfectly. But suppose if you left it out in the rain, what happens to that chair? It starts to warp. The legs get weak. And when you sit down in it, you might, you, could, you know, you could fall off. Same as our conscience. It's not perfect. It's not very clear sometimes. And it's not always right. Sometimes our conscience tells you that it's okay to do these things. That it's not bad. But you have to bring your conscience and God's word together. It's your compass. You know, if you're going to go north, east, west, south, the compass, you follow the compass, right? You have to compare it with other compasses, right? To make sure your compass is working and that they both point north. You have to make sure, right? Same as our conscience, we bring it together with God's word. God's word should inform our conscience or teach our conscience. God's word makes it clear, not just our conscience. You know, when you say it's okay to follow your heart, that's not okay. It deceives us. It can lead us the wrong way. You know, what if your GPS is broken? Would you still follow it? No, you sure wouldn't. You know, our heart is broken. It comes from the lineage of Adam. When we follow our hearts, it'll be okay? No. You have to follow God's word. So you remember the story of Pinocchio and Jimmy the Cricket? Jimmy the Cricket. Jiminy Cricket was a puppet.
and the man who made him wished that he was a real boy. This blue fairy who had power made the puppet become alive. He wasn't on the strings, but he didn't look like necessarily a real boy. But the fairy told him, if you be brave and truthful and not selfish, you will become like a real boy. But the problem was he didn't have a conscience, knowing what was right and wrong. So Jiminy Cricket became his conscience. He knew exactly what was right and wrong. And he would warn Pinocchio about what he was doing. About going to school, you know, he'd get involved in a bad group of boys, you know, got in trouble. He almost became a donkey. Part donkey. And he realized, you know, it was just messed up. He lied. And the blue fairy asked him, why did you stray? Why did you not go to school? Tell her the truth. Tell her the truth, Jiminy Cricket warned. And he told a lie, and so what happened? His nose grew, and it continued to grow because he was not listening to his conscience. And our conscience is not the same like Jiminy Cricket. It's not that clear. So when you feel your conscience, or you feel guilty, you focus on your guilt, trying to satisfy your conscience, you will never satisfy your own guilt. Your guilt will never offer you forgiveness. You know, maybe you try to do something good to make it feel better and that the guilt will decrease. No, it does not. You need to depend on what? You need to depend on Christ and satisfy God's wrath. He was satisfied with Jesus, not with you, and your conscience will never equal. So you teach your conscience is not perfect and it is not always clear. So it says, cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. It's not the other way, your conscience and focusing on your conscience and how you make yourself better and how you make yourself feel better. No, the conscience will deceive you. It is not clear. Don't try to satisfy your conscience or your guilt. God is the only one. So keep your conscience clear. It's by holding on to your faith in Christ. That helps your conscience remain clear. You can't fo focus only on your conscience and follow your heart. You're going to feel awkward and think that your, your conscience, you're not saved. But you look to the cross.